Fed by snows of the Mont Blanc Massive in the French Alps, the ice of the Vallée Blanche and Glacier du Géant converges and flows over the Serac du Géant. Joined by ice from Glacier des Périodes and Glacier d'Anvers du Plain, it becomes Glacier du Tacou and then merges with Glacier de Léchaud. It is then known as the Mer de Glace. Discovered in June 1741 from the site of Montenver by William Wyndham and Reverend Richard Pocock, its undulating form reminded them of the seas of Greenland, as if frozen in time. The Sea of Ice was appropriately named. This region of the glacier remained accessible only by winding mountain paths, with the help of guides and mules, for over a century and a half. An 1835 cartoon likens the glacier to a perilous sea tossing ill-equipped tourists around. Undeterred by the perils of glacier exploration, visitor numbers grew and around 12,000 visited in 1885. Thirteen years after its initial proposal, construction of the Montenvert Cog Railway began in 1905. It was completed four years later, with nearly 24,000 visitors in its first year alone. The steam locomotives were replaced by electric ones in 1954, and today the train continues to provide the easiest way for tourists to reach Montenvert and view La Mer de Glace. The view is rather different though. Wyndham and Pocock had a very different view than a tourist even a hundred years ago. Very cold winters between 1590 and 1645 led to the glacier reaching down into the Chamonix Valley below, threatening to obstruct it. Around 1700 the religious folk of the day resorted to trying to exorcise the evil glacier spirits. The Bishop of Geneva was called in. Well, when there's something strange in your neighbourhood, you've got to call someone. By 1825, the glacier still ended in the valley with a wall of ice 40 metres high, near the village of Les Bois, but the glacier started receding in subsequent years. A popular tourist attraction of the day was a cave at the foot of the glacier, carved by the river Arveyron, which is fed by the glacier meltwater. It was last seen in 1873, despite a significant advance of ice around 1850, the last cold interval of the Little Ice Age. A similar feature exists in the foot of the glacier today. But even from this vantage point some 600 metres above the valley floor, it was a kilometre away when this photo was taken. The glacier's foot has retreated around 2.5 kilometres since the 1830s. In the Mer de Glace Valley, it's not hard to see where the ice used to be. The steep, boulder-strewn slopes with little vegetation pretty much mark the level of the glacier around 1820. These slopes are simply too steep to become covered with vegetation and remain barren. Rock falls are common. The modern equivalent of the water-cut Arveyron cave visited by tourists in the 19th century is the man-made Grotte de Glace. First created in 1946, it provides tourists with the opportunity to see glacial ice firsthand. A cable car to provide easier access was built in the 60s and replaced with the current gondola, which opened in 1988. It descends about 130 metres below Montenver. When it entered service, the glacier had seen modest increases and the ice wasn't far below the gondola station, so tourists had only a short walk to reach the ice grotto. Since around 1990, though, the length and thickness of the glacier have nosedived. The gondola is now at the top of a sloped path attached to the cliffs, with over 430 steps to descend to the Grotte de Glace. The path must be extended each year as the glacier recedes. It is now more than 100 metres below the lower gondola station. The ice level has declined more in the last 25 years than in pretty much the previous century. As you walk down, dated markers show the decline in the level of the glacier, with 2010 being the last signed level. In 2011, the last flight of stairs was on this polished section of bedrock. The bottom of these stairs is where the glacier was in 2010. At the time, the grotto was cut into a modestly impressive wall of ice that extended further down the valley. The remnants of previous year's grottos are higher in that wall of ice. Just three years later, in 2014, it's gone. Whilst the foot of the glacier is still further down the valley, the ice has thinned such that there is no longer a wall of ice here to cut into. The grotto is now effectively cut into the front of the glacier at this location, and it isn't far below the surface. There are two additional long flights of stairs from the 2010 level, some smaller flights of stairs, a longer bridge, and a 10 metre or so walk into the grotto. Looking back up from the outside of the grotto, note the two small sets of stairs by the small staff cabin. Seven steps and you're on the bridge. A year later in 2015, and the walkway has been further extended, and there's now another full flight of stairs. It's easy to see the pace of change in this place. 
Carving the grotto is arguably contributing to the problem it faces. Large holes running into the ice allow warm air in to melt it. This side of the glacier is notably more depleted than the other. At some point, the carving of the grotto will either have to be stopped or moved further up the valley. However, the glacier is expected to recede between 600 and 900 meters in the next 20 or so years, so the lifespan of any relocated grotto won't last long. Tourism aside, just a few hundred meters further up the valley is where mountaineers access the glacier. They too have seen their journey lengthen in the last 30 years. A progressively extended set of ladders, ropes and clutch pedal steps provides access down the cliffs. Whilst descending to the level of the glacier requires a head for heights and steady footing, in 2011 getting onto the ice had some objective dangers in the form of crevasses large enough to do you some serious damage. Although paths between them could easily exist, such route selection is no longer necessary. The change over just a few years is clearly visible from the top of the ladders. By 2014 the crevasses are all but gone, and a year later only a few small cracks remain. Marginal crevasses like these appear at the edges of glaciers due to the friction at the sides slowing down the ice compared to the flow in the centre. The crevasses don't extend to the bottom of the glacier, as the lower ice under pressure from the ice above is more plastic. For crevasses to be disappearing suggests that the glacier is melting faster than its motion can fracture the denser ice that has now been exposed. With less mass, the glacier also moves more slowly. Heading up the valley from the bottom of the ladders, we come to a region 500 meters away where crevasses once spanned most of the width of the glacier as the ice deformed around Les Echelles. Just a few years ago, mountaineers could practice their ice skills here. By 2014, this was no longer possible. Mountaineers now have to travel 1.5 kilometers from the ladders to reach steep ice. But here, the area used by mountaineers is created not by the motion of the glacier, but by a torrent of meltwater that has cut a large gorge into the ice. To reach steep ice that is the result of the glacier's own motion, one now needs to travel an additional 1.5 kilometers further up to where Glacier de Tacul deforms as it descends the underlying rock and combines with Glacier de Lechaux. The decline in the level of the ice can be seen all the way up here and up into the Lesho Valley. Looking back down the main valley from here, the flatness of the ice stands out. It's not really unfair to say that for the whole of the Mer de Glace, features such as seracs and crevasses that gave the glacier its name are essentially gone. Where crevasses are still visible, they're nearly all small enough to step over and shallow enough that you'd have to try to fall into them. The features that one sees all over the surface of the glacier today are primarily the result of it melting. Small water channels are everywhere. In addition, as the ice melts, more rock is exposed. Glaciers naturally embed and carry stones of all kinds. When exposed, small stones are heated by the sun, they melt the ice and gravity pulls them down, effectively drilling into it. This presents more surface area to the sun and to the air. Larger rocks can shelter the underlying ice, but only in the immediate vicinity. A blanketing of rock, however, can insulate the glacier to some extent, but even though the foot of the glacier is well covered, it is still receding by around 40 meters per year. Now glaciers have grown and receded throughout history. Glaciation once filled the entire Chamonix Valley and far beyond, but what makes the modern retreat of the Mer de Glace, and indeed glaciers all over the world, different is the pace of their retreat. A glacier remains in equilibrium when the amount of ice provided to it by snowfalls balances the loss of mass due to ablation. It's as simple as that. All the glaciers in the area are retreating. The Bosson Glacier is the fastest moving glacier in the Chamonix Valley and responds to climactic changes quickly. It serves as an indicator for what the other glaciers will do in coming years as their trends lag behind it. Like La Mer de Glace, Glacier des Bossons used to reach down into the valley and was also subject to villagers calling for exorcisms and holding religious processions at its foot to try and make it go away. However, in the absence of magic, the real reason for the loss of the glacier ice here and all over the world is quite simple. Heat ice and it melts. There's no dispute on the physics there. So whilst climate change deniers might like to come up with such facile arguments as it's cold where I live today so the world can't be warming up, perhaps they could explain a consistent trend of recession of glaciers like La Mer de Glace and explain why it has lost more ice in the last 30 years than the prior century. La Mer de Glace and the glaciers that feed it don't exist in climactic isolation. This region's weather, like anywhere else in the world, is part of a bigger picture. It's almost as if there's some kind of 
global climate that seems to be, what's the word, changing. The fact that carbon dioxide traps heat is a known physical property of that gas, and others such as methane. There is no getting around that either. So why then do climate change deniers think that you can pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere on industrial scales for 200 years and have no effect? That sounds pretty unrealistic to me, particularly when the effects and long-term trends are easy to see in something as simple as ice. If you'd like to see more historic images of La Mer de Glace that I haven't used in this video, you'll find links in the description. Thanks for watching.